know, the question that's being posed here is um, how can we make the economy work for the poor? Um, I've, I've got a problem with that sort of uh, proposition um, because it presumes that the economy is a thing. You know, it's like a machine and you can tinker with it in some ways and then it delivers something differently. Um, and I think we've seen in recent times very concretely that what's called the economy is about relations of power, relations between people, owners of wealth, workers, people who are unemployed, etc. And they're contesting things. Um, so that this notion that is, there's some entity called the economy which uh, you, you can tinker a little bit with, I think is a false one, a deeply false one, and one that has disarmed us as people, as citizens for many years. We're probably living at one of the worst times in human history where so much of public debate has been settled by economists. So that, you know, there's a bumper sticker that people drive around that says, you know, my lawyer can beat your lawyer any day. Now we are invited to believe that we should have a bumper sticker that says my economist can beat your economist. And, and so we are disarmed. We don't play any role in making decisions about what our lives, the lives of society should look like because what trumps everything else is an analysis and a presentation of things from people called economists. And I, and I, I, th I think that is one of the crises of our times that that has happened. So that when we uh, take a very simple issue like the right to education and the fact that every child should receive education, that education should be free and accessible and good quality, what we come up against are a group of people who will say, but the rating agencies, if they look at what that's going to imply to the economy, that's simply unsustainable. So it gets trumped immediately by a, an, an analysis of that order. And I think that's been one of our big problems. It's not just our problems. I think one of the problems in our time in South Africa has been that so many of the organizations who are historically of the left, have also imbibed that. And so they've come into these debates by saying we need an alternative economic policy. And, and I'm going to list them. We've been through probably 20 different economic, not policies, but economic programs suggested, particularly out of Kosatu and out of the labor movement, and I think that's been part of the sad and sorry demise of the labor movement as a force for social change in this country, that they've been so entrenched in that particular process. I'm going to argue that our problem has got nothing to do with the economy. Our problem is that we have actually a very <coughs> constrained democracy. Our capacity to shape and make politicians behave differently has become increasingly limited. And what, on the other hand, gives me enormous sense of new possibilities is that in the last while, we're beginning to see movements emerging, struggles emerging, that suggest that that sort of brick wall of economic policy determining is being steadily broken down by actions of striking workers after the Mar Marikana massacre, of people in communities that have been fighting for better services for many years, their agency suggests that the route to making changes in the economy lies in strengthening movements of change, of struggle on the ground. And that that's not the prerogative of economists and economic panels. It's, a very is it's an issue about the contestation of the terrain of democracy. And I think the mistake too many have made has been to to look at things from a so-called economic perspective, okay? Now, we probably have the world record for the most attempts at economic programs. Um, I, I, I don't want to list all of them. People with longer memories may remember uh, the ANC prior to coming to power in 1994 uh, commissioned a group of economists uh, called the Macroeconomic Research Group, the Merg people, they came up with a document 
very comprehensive, looked at the, the processes of how by South Africa investing in education, in public housing, in, in improving public health, that that would improve productivity, improve the levels of, of, con uh, of income in the country, and that we could have a kind of a, a growth path shaped in that particular way. And it was ended, and, and one of the people who served on that, Ben Fine, told me a story of literally being um, on the night before they were going to launch the Merck document as ANC policy, that uh, Trevor Manuel came around and said the ANC is no longer endorsing this as its policy. So the matter was settled not <coughs> through intellectual engagement, but by simple bureaucratic decree. Um, and, and, and that was the end of that. Um, since then, Kusatu has been replete with you know, the RDP. There was something called job equity. Um, now, recently, they've got another program called the uh, New Growth Path. Uh, so, so, you know, the, the, the plethora of attempts at economic programs has, as, 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 as I say, has pitched us at the level of some kind of, um, well, let's say, world record. Secondly, there's been no lack of attempts at process issues of dealing with, this, with these, these issues. In other words, Let's not put out, put out a content, but let's bring together everybody across the social partners and somehow other through consensus and discussion we'll have a new policy. And so, I mean, that predates the end of apartheid. There was something called the National Economic Forum, again, at the, at the behest of Kosatu. We've had the setting up of NEDLAC. Um, we've, uh, we've had these various advisory panels. Um, we've had the Millennium Advisory Panel. We've had, after the 2009 financial crash, a um, joint meeting of business and labor and government, and they put out a, a statement. In other words, we've consistently had these uh, claims that, uh, as South Africans, we'll all pull together. And yet, what has any of them delivered in terms of substantially changing anything? Nothing. Now, the, the point is that the the architecture of the South African economy has been pretty much um, laid out. And actually, one of the key dates is not 1996 that people often associate with the gear policy, but 1987, which was under the Nationalist Party where they announced a program of privatization of state assets, deregulation, and um, a series of interventions, including at an attempt in 1998 to make even the labor market more flexible. And all that's happened is, in a sense, the ANC has continued that trajectory of opening South Africa, that of uh, produce, coming up with more and more uh, relaxation of exchange controls, of allowing the principal monopolies that have for years dominated this country to leave. So, uh, um, I mean, Iraj speaks about uh, investors and some. Who are these investors? The, you know, up, till 19, to, uh, up until the 1980s, 85% of all the shares traded on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange was owned by six companies, Anglo-American, Anglo-Vol, Liberty Life, Sunlum, um, Old Mutual. Almost all of these have relocated outside the country. They've shifted their principal uh, trading spheres to London and to a certain extent Melbourne and Sydney and, and so on. And much of our econ so-called economic policy has been shaped by the needs to service those monopolies that have been the kernel, the core of driving the process of mining and industrialization in this country. I would argue one of the main reasons, for instance, why the obsession with the RAND is so important is that although these companies have relocated to London, their assets, their mining assets in particular, are largely RAND denominated. So they, in a sense, have to try and protect the RAND at all costs because they have to translate the RAND as the source of their revenue in this country into foreign currency. Um, in, in the centers where the share trading actually happens. Now, South Africa in that sense is a success story. 
I think it's important to understand that we now have the second biggest beer company in the world, South African breweries. Okay, Mondi is now the biggest paper and pulp company in Europe. Okay, in London, the biggest source of private health care is Nedcare, South African company. Okay, um, so so this myth, and I think you know that somehow other we as South Africans must somehow do something special because otherwise investors, skittish investors, are going to go south elsewhere, is a myth. A week ago, the level of trading on the JSE reached record levels. Okay? In other words, this is major buying of equity and bonds in South Africa. So in that sense, the ANC has been an enormous success story for this country. It's just that the poor are not part of the success. The middle classes, in large, to the large extent, are not part of the success. And all the things that we regard as so pivotal to the quality of people's lives, like education and so on, are not priorities for a government who, to a large extent, has served its purpose. It has successfully promoted South Africa as a, an important destin destination for investment, it has helped South African corporations to become world-class players. And now we are a member of the BRICS group of countries setting up a BRICS bank. So we are right up there with India, China, and Brazil as countries who are seeking to lever power, new power relations in a world in which the U.S. is in economic decline. This is far cry from this notion of the inefficiency of government and so on. Government in that sense is very efficient. It's just that it's efficient in the areas that help with capital accumulation. But when it comes to education, when it comes to health, that's not inefficiency, that's abandonment. Okay? The poor in that sense don't matter because they, don't, they are in the economy but they don't matter as priorities. They are not matters of concern. I mean, I have a very interesting quote here from this much lauded new, what's this called, new development plan. And I mean, it should be something stuck on the walls everywhere. Uh, sorry, I, okay, I need to put my specs on. But I mean, this is priceless. The NDP says that South Africa has the capacity to eliminate poverty and reduce inequality over the next two de decades. This requires a new approach. And what is this new approach? One that moves from passive citizenry receiving services from the state to one that systematically includes the socially and economically excluded where people are active champions in their own development. Now, in other words, passive citizens must not expect anything from the state. That's the problem of our times. We have passive citizens who have the temerity to believe that they must receive services from the state. Okay? Unfortunately, they're not so passive. I mean, the last 10 years, there's been mass programs of, of tire burning, of interventions, fighting for service delivery. None of the citizens have been passive, but leave that aside for the moment. This notion that citizens deserve something from the state is unthinkable. Okay? You need to be drivers of your own development. You know, as I say, that's code for saying, if you want education, form your own means to do that. Or NGOs or somebody else will help out. But it's not government's responsibility to do that. Okay? So, so what we have is not that the poor is excluded from the economy. is that the poor's relation to the rest of the economy is a subordinate one. And that the focus and the priority is to help with what we call the financialization of South Africa's major corporations. Okay? In other words, economic policy has got to be driven to ensure, and, and the elements are there. We have to have high real interest rates, a strong RAND. We've got to keep the budget deficit as small as possible because people who do um, leveraging on money across borders, etc., have to have these at as low a level as possible. We've got to satisfy the bond market. And in that sense, the state, the government, is enormously efficient. Okay? SARS is enormously efficient, by the way, etc. So it's, it's a method, you know, this thing about inefficiency of government. 
Now, wh what, why do I suggest that this is a problem of democracy? The problem is, to come back to the Kusatu and the sad story of the labor movement, is that I think it's a mistake to continue to, to think, seek to sit in rooms and think of new economic policies as an act of engaging and then hoping to win rationally the debate. At the moment, the, the economic debate in South Africa is, is, at least as seen through the media and so on, is a, is a debate between two people, two lots of sort of perspectives. The one is, how do you help the rich to become richer by having the state help them to become richer? And the other one is, how do you help the rich to become richer by getting out of the way so they can do it themselves? So the whole center of gravity is about that, okay? It doesn't enter the equation, the notion of some kind of transformation, some kind of notion of equality. That doesn't enter the equation at all. And for that, we can't blame government, the ANC. Or we need to blame the fact that we don't have a movement, a, a, a political and social movement that can challenge the power that currently is exercised through the big corporations and which government serves in this particular period. And that's the real source why the economic debate gets no further than the questions of so-called state inefficiency or, you know, how do you help investors uh, carry out and, 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 and become wealthier. Because the, there's no credible alternative force, the, the center of gravity lies so far to the right that to enter the field of prescriptions and rationality, I think, is to play to a gallery that's enormously unsympathetic and has no particular interest in settling that debate intellectually. So these questions need to be settled by the old questions of contesting democracy, and that is by public pressure, by demonstrations, by building organizations on the ground, by recognizing that what is called the poor itself has agency and is acting as we speak. Throughout our country, we have movements of people who, as we speak, are contesting these issues of power. And if any of us have a, a commitment and an, an undertaking a moral sense of wanting to change things for the better, then the source of where or the, the, the focus of our attention should be how can we assist in those processes? Because there are many things that are limited by the current struggles that are being waged there. But if we want to turn this into something that's not just about demonstrations and, 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 and township-based uh, uh, struggles and so on, but to a broader public debate, then we can in our own way assist by opening up that public debate a lot more and saying, let's view this from the point of view of those people who are struggling today in that particular way. I mean, I'll use two examples. Uh, the, Marikana is often presented as if it's a tragedy. And the killing of 34 workers is violently by the state is a tragedy. But what it has unleashed is a sense amongst that whole newer layer of mining workers that, in a sense, ironically, almost as the NDP says, they're no longer going to be passive citizens waiting for a non-responsive government. They are going to be very active. And that's precisely where they are now. Similarly with the farm workers. All the economists and the academics said, you know, 150 rand, that's unsustainable, the farms, etc. They, they didn't get what they wanted, but they fought, they demonstrated, they appealed to public sympathy, and in a sense, they achieved progress. They achieved, to a certain extent, a shift in the power relations, which means that in the next period, what will shape relations in the rural areas and in the mines will be determined by those people who came out as active citizens and challenged those power relations. And for me, that's the way that we can shift and change economic policy. It's where we no longer dispel our notions of things that we regard as our rights where we no longer dispel our notions of equality and good education and free education, and we regard those as legitimate, and we're prepared to struggle for those things. That's when we shift the economic debate. At the moment, it's a debate, as I say, it's a kind of, it's an in-house debate between various people 
who fundamentally agree on the same, on the architecture and the trajectory of developments economically. We need to be breaking down the walls of that elite group. And I think for th that, I think, is the most important question that can shape South Africa in the next period. Thank you.